Want to hear something gross? Quote, There were the men in the pickle rooms, for instance, scarce a one of these that had not some spot of horror on his person. Let a man so much as scrape his finger pushing a truck in the pickle rooms, and he might have a sore that would put him out of the world. All the joints in his fingers might be eaten by the acid one by one. Of the butchers and floorsmen, the beef boners and trimmers, and all those who used knives, you could scarcely find a person who had the use of his thumb. Time and time again, the base of it had been slashed till it was a mere lump of flesh against which the man pressed the knife to hold it. The hands of these men would be crisscrossed with cuts until you could no longer pretend to count them or trace them, each one representing a chance for blood poisoning. They would have no nails. They would be worn off by pulling hides. Their knuckles were so swollen that their fingers spread out like a fan. I don't think I'm alone here. I thought that sounded a little sensational. I'm Tommy Thompson, and this is Dirty History. We got a lot, and I've been, uh, hmm. I've been thinking a lot about how to tell this story, where to start, what's important, what I should only mention, what I should explain in great detail. And in thinking about that, I realized that I didn't want to only list stats and grievances. I didn't want this episode to be a list. I didn't want to give you dates and times, names and places, and tell you to go interpret it and bring back your findings next week. No, I wanted a narrative. I wanted a story. So naturally, I gravitated to The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, and that's when this episode hit me. To understand slaughterhouses, we need to understand those who wrote about the conditions, those who gave us the accounts. The most famous account, of course, was Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. It was the basis upon which many writers and historians have built their own accounts. You see, the problem with that, though, is The Jungle is a work of fiction. It's a novel. But yet it achieves something, something extraordinary. It became the accepted narrative for understanding labor conditions during the Industrial Revolution. It's that thing that we all studied. It's where we got our education about labor conditions. And it's a work of fiction. It had an axe to grind. It's a good story. But I think we can find something a little dirtier. So if you found that quote at the start of the show gross, well, one, you're not alone. Two, you're going to have a long episode ahead of you. But if you didn't find it gross, well, strap in. I'll do my best to change that. So let's start the story. And where else besides the man who inserted himself in the middle of it? Upton Sinclair. And... Don't get me wrong, I hate biographical information as much as the next person. I think it's dry, I think it's tedious, but I also, I see the use for it now. It's important and we gotta do it. There's a couple of things that I think if we know it about Upton Sinclair, we will understand about the jungle later. It's gonna pay dividends later on in the show. So let's do it now, let's get it out of the way, I'll make it as fun as possible, and then We'll have a good idea of a baseline. We'll have a good starting point for the story. So Upton Sinclair was born September 20th, 1878 in Baltimore, Maryland, to Upton Beale Sinclair Sr., an alcoholic liquor salesman who we'll call Sinclair Sr. from now on, and Priscilla Harden Sinclair, a strong-willed, puritanical woman who couldn't stand coffee, tea, or alcohol. So like every good marriage, Priscilla would come to resent her husband Sinclair Sr., and Upton's life was like that, chock full of contradictions and dichotomies. His mother came from a wealthy Baltimore family. His aunt married a millionaire. He spent a good deal of time with his grandparents, but at the end of the day, and I know this may come as a shock, Sinclair Sr. was not the best liquor salesman. And I know what you're thinking. The alcoholic wasn't a good liquor salesman, but I'm afraid that's the case. So Upton's life was teetering on poverty. It's here that we see many of Upton's later themes become ingrained in him. He understands from an early age that there's a split in how people live. He understands that some are wealthy and some are poor. 
it's in his childhood he begins to understand the game, you know, fat cats and starving dogs and all that. So Upton saw the difference in lifestyle. He just needed someone to point at and say, that's what failure looks like. And of course, he finds that in his father. You see, Sinclair Sr. did love his son. Various biographers tell how he, quote, worshipped Upton. And that makes sense considering that Upton was his only child. But as it came to pass, Sinclair Sr. was often drunk, or busy, or both. Drunkenly busy. Which I'm not sure is possible, but hey, if there's a will, there's a way. So Upton was left with his mother, who was very strict as to be expected, considering her own background as, you know, deeply religious. This disallowed Sinclair much independence in his early life. He didn't get out much. He slept on the couch and at the foot of his parents' bed. Sometimes he was allowed to spread out and sleep with his mother when his father was away. Ooh. His mother instilled her Christian ideals into little Upton's psyche, you know. By age five, he taught himself how to read, and after that he said, quote, I didn't want to do anything but read. And oh boy, he read. He finished his mother's entire bookshelf and then moved on to classics like Homer and Chaucer. So you know he was a great time at parties. It was at age 10 when his family moved to New York City. His father had to find a new job because, well, he wasn't selling as much alcohol as he was drinking. So Upton starts school at age 10, and he becomes an avid reader of Percy Blythe Shelley and Shakespeare. (laughs) Oh, God. He actually told, he actually told a biographer that he was an avid reader of Shelley and Shakespeare. So he's what we would call a douchebag. I mean, that's going to be a new dirty history thing. We're going to have a douchebag alert every single time someone says something like that. And the first inaugural douchebag award, I'm sorry, douchebag alert, goes to Upton Sinclair for proclaiming how much he loved Shelley and Shakespeare at age at age 10. <clears throat> I got to... I gotta get back into my radio voice. <clears throat> At age 14, he attends City College in New York. He pays for it by writing Pulp Fiction, not the movie, the genre. And he's able to move his family into an apartment with the money he makes. All the while, he's taking visits back to his wealthy grandparents, you know, getting his dose of culture. Shortly after graduating City College, Upton pays the enrollment fee to attend Columbia, and by 20, he is totally graduated, and he's ready to be taken seriously as a novelist. However, he finds that's a little harder than he thought it was going to be, so he gets work as a freelance journalist, which is another way of saying he's unemployed. By 21, he's married, and shortly thereafter has a kid. Now, the thing about Upton and his marriage is his mother instilled her puritanical views on him, so he believes that Sex is only for procreation. Now, what does that mean exactly? We're not too sure. You know, he could have sex with his wife, roll off and say, Oh, you pregnant? No? All right, round two. And just hop back on again. So by him saying that sex is only for procreation, we're not sure exactly what that means. You know, it could be like, well, you pregnant today? Oh, you're not? Uh, I guess we got to try again. Oh, boy. You pregnant now? No? Oh, we're trying again. Round three. And it just keeps going like that. So... How much of it is, you know, Christian posturing and how much of it is actual religious faith, we're not too sure. And we come to see that a little bit later in his life, that um, dichotomy and what what is actual religious faith. So um, it's 1901. He has a kid. And he puts out his first novel, Springtime and Harvest, which is about as exciting as it sounds. He shops it around to a couple of publishers and uh, no one bites, so he publishes it himself. And it's a bomb. He writes a few more to the same effect as the first. They're really critical and commercial failures, and he is fed up with writing Pulp Fiction. He wants to be taken seriously, and he feels like writing, quote, the trash that he was working in was not was not what he wanted to be doing, you know? So he's pretty much penniless at this point. He's writing what he considers inferior work. His marriage is on the rocks. He's a growing disdain for the upper class, which through his voracious appetite for reading, kind of leads him down some rabbit holes, you know. And by 1903, Sinclair was in line with what he called a secular religion. See, this is that this is that whole convenient Christianity kind of thing about Upton Sinclair. He found what he called a secular religion, which is really just socialism. 
So by 1903, Sinclair was a card-carrying socialist. He comes into the employ of a socialist newspaper called Appeal to Reason, and he's sent to write an expose on working conditions in Chicago. At this point, most biographies say case closed. He gets to Chicago, writes The Jungle, and the rest is history. But this is where we're going to diverge from the popular history and take a look at what he was going to see on the ground, you know? Sinclair gets to Chicago. What does it look like on the street? Eric Larson wrote about this in his um, book, The Devil in the White City. He writes about the conditions of the street, and he wrote, quote, In poor neighborhoods, garbage mounded in alleys and overflowed giant trash boxes that became banquet halls for rats and blue-bottle flies. Billions of flies. The corpses of dogs, cats, and horses often remained where they fell. In January, they froze into disheartening positions. In August, they ballooned and ruptured. Many ended up in the Chicago River, the city's main commercial artery. During heavy rains, river water flowed in a greasy plume far out into Lake Michigan to the towers that mark the intake pipes for the city's drinking water. In rain, any street not paved with macadam oozed a fragrant muck of horse manure, mud, and garbage that swelled between granite blocks like pus from a wound. Author Paul Lindau called it a, quote, a gigantic peep show of utter horror, but extraordinarily to the point. I mean, the whole city stunk like incinerated hair, garbage, and manure. The writer of the Jungle Book, Rudyard Kipling, said of it, quote, I desire never to return again. It is inhabited by savages. Newspapers ran comparisons to other cities. Quote, I think Rome in its worst day had nothing on Chicago. The journalist Jacob Reese, talking about the alleys and streets of Chicago, said, quote, Never in our worst years have we ever had so much filth in New York City. So Chicago was disgusting. Hell on earth. Smelled like, quote, the pits of hell. I mean, that's, that's pretty harsh. I mean, the scholarship's there. People have talked about how shitty Chicago is at this time. So why does Upton Sinclair need to go there? Well, he goes to Chicago for the slaughterhouses. And I guess we probably want to know why the slaughterhouses are there. And as far as these things go, it's pretty simple. The whole industry, since its inception, has been at the mercy of geographical factors. You gotta have water supply. You gotta have drainage. Someone's gotta drink the milkshake somewhere. And you gotta have a nearness to market. Now, with the advent of the railroad and telegraph, nearness to market isn't a primary concern, but drainage and water are still crucial. Chicago had those two major resources in abundance. The Chicago River was a natural drainage system, while Lake Michigan was a near unlimited water supply. Now, the only problem was, the Chicago River drained into Lake Michigan, where the people got their drinking water. So needless to say, people got sick. I mean, in 1885, the sewage-tainted drinking water led to 10% of the population dying from cholera and typhoid. 10% of the city. So why were they getting sick? Well, the slaughterhouses and the rendering plants and the fermenting factories for you know, liquor and whatnot, these factories were dumping all of their waste into the Chicago River. And it flowed up and reached the intake valves at Lake Michigan. I mean, one part of the Chicago River gets so bad, they nickname it Bubbly Creek. So this nickname portion is the South Fork of the Chicago River, and it's bad. I mean, really bad. So bad that it actually bubbles today. The bubbling, of course, was caused by decomposition of animal parts in the river. The gases rose to the top and caused some bubbles. I mean, the shores of the river were plastered with fur from the animals. The oxidized fat and the grease released from the animals decomposing, it got so thick in spots that it hardened and chickens would walk across it. The river was likened to looking like it had the surface of lava. You know, that cracked, rocky kind of look. Yeah, that's what the river looked like. 
sometimes some drunk people would think they're walking on land and they would just fall through. I mean, and it was it was dark colored. It was blood filled. It was disgusting. One of these Chicagoans gets pretty wise about it and decides that he's going to start skimming grease off of the top of the river and selling it as lard. Well, it's pretty profitable and it works out for him until the slaughterhouses catch wind that he's doing that and they file an injunction against him saying only they can skim their grease from the river. So the slaughterhouses, they start skimming the river grease and selling it off as lard. So your sausage, which we're not even going to get into what is in your sausage yet. So your sausage that has only God knows what inside of it is being cooked in river grease. Most people don't even know what the hell river grease is. Hell, I'm not even sure what river grease is, and I'm the one who's telling you about it. And it was cooked in it. Ugh. God, that's disgu- That's disgusting. That's where I draw the line. When you start skimming grease off a river and telling me it's lard, which is disgusting in the first place, I really, really am not going to trust you. So, I mean, it's only a wonder why the people were getting sick. I mean, it gets so bad that the city starts filing these, uh, these regulations. They put in these rules that they thought were needed to be said. They weren't common sense at this point. 1833, they put the first regulation about the Chicago River in place, and they say you cannot dump dead animals into the river. It was such a common practice that they had to file a regulation that says you cannot dump a dead animal in the river. And they charged you $3 each time you did it. The next year in 1834, a cholera epidemic breaks out. Everyone's getting cholera. So we got to tighten the regulations. They put some new ones and say you cannot dump putrid meat. You cannot dump decaying vegetables. You can't dump, quote, any offensive substance, whatever. And they increased the fine to $5 for each offense. Now, I mean, ordinances, ordinances are only effective if they are enforced, and these fines for dumping most certainly were not enforced, and the carcasses of rotting animals found their way into the river almost daily. And this is in 1834. We still have many more typhoid and cholera epidemics to go, and this is pre-germ theory of disease. So they still believe that disease spread through sense of smell. And to top that fact off, where else was the city, but downwind from the slaughterhouses. So people thought bad smells brought disease, and they were getting a whiff of the slaughterhouse every day. Louis Pasteur does his experiments on the germ theory in 1860 to 1864. A paper comes out shortly thereafter. But the problem is, a lot of people don't really buy into it. A lot of the poor working class that really needed to know what was going on weren't buying into the germ theory, which is ironic because they're the ones that needed it the most. So in 1869, a bunch of Chicago officials, you know, bureaucrats and newspaper guys, they, they, they form an official, quote, smelling committee, a smelling committee, to go down the river, see what the deal is, and report back what they find. I mean, and this is in mid-August, so it's hot. And those smells really begin to ferment in that heat. And, I mean, the slaughterhouses, the rendering plants, the distilleries, it's a pretty gnarly smell. The inspectors start up north in Lake Michigan, and it's not too bad. They get around Buren Street, which is south, and they go even further south towards the slaughterhouses, and things get, things get pretty, pretty gnarly pretty quick. A member of the Tribune commented on an unknown odor, one that, quote, baffled the efforts made by the noses on the gentlemen to analyze it. They didn't know what it was. Off the port bow of the boat, the committee watched a group of boys swimming in the ambiguously smelling water, having left their clothing behind. Another group of boys dressed themselves on the bank, and the committee watched as their skin was tinged by the black water. Ugh. This is my favorite part. They get to a certain point in the river and they talk about the way it smelled. And the best way they found to describe it was by calling it, quote, the most admirable stench. The most admirable stench. Hmm. 
the city dumped domestic waste into the river as well as the commercial variety. So, uh, what's domestic waste? Domestic waste is shit and piss, along with the rotting carcasses. So the smell committee report comes in. The city's running short on ideas. They pass some more ordinances, but nothing much happens, you know. And by 1892, with ordinances failing, ideas running short, and the germ theory being accepted, work began to redirect the Chicago River. They figured the best way to solve their problem was to redirect the entire river. I mean, it's an engineering marvel. They changed the flow of a river because their drinking water was being infected by rotting carcasses. One man commented on the on the Chicago drainage canal and he said, while Chicago is recognized as one of the healthiest large cities in the world, it was growing so rapidly that engineering skill was invoked to ascertain what more could be done to ensure future healthfulness. He's talking about the canal here. And he called Chicago one of the healthiest large cities in the world. If that's true, then imagine what it's like elsewhere. In an effort to save people from the filth, redirecting began... September 3rd, 1892, and it cost nearly $28 million and took until 1897 to finish. And you kind of have to look at what redirection of the river was. The answer to poison drinking water was to push it away from where you were drinking into every other place down river. The redirection didn't mean it you know, the Chicago River just didn't go into Lake Michigan, it meant that the Chicago River dumped into the Mississippi. Chicago filth just went national. And their their theory behind it, their theory, was that, oh, the abundance of water from the Mississippi will dilute down the harmful bacteria to a safe drinkable level. Huh. And it worked. Some of the time. When it rained hard enough, the Chicago River would redirect flow back into Lake Michigan and you would see, again, stiff cats and decaying horses. And the smell, it didn't go anywhere. So this is what Upton Sinclair sees. This is what he smells when he gets to Chicago. When he first steps off that bus or hops off his horse or whatever the hell he did when he got there. And he looks around. And he's going to see filth. He's going to see rubbish. He's going to see horses dead on the street. He's going to see animals floating in the river. He's going to see drinking water that isn't safe. He's going to see people vomiting. He's going to see people dying. He's going to see death, grime, filth, and it's dirty. And we're going to see what he really thinks about all of this on part two of Slaughterhouses. And that's it. Episode one's in the bag. I hope you liked it. If you didn't, hey, leave me a comment. Tell me what you think I could change. This is a work in progress, and uh, we're going to grow, and we're going to evolve with the audience. So, uh... Let me know what we could do better. I'd love to hear from you. You can stay in contact or you can get all the updates about the show on the social medias. Follow me on Instagram at Tommy underscore Tombstones, Twitter at Pod Dirty, P-O-D-D-I-R-T-Y. I refuse to get a Facebook. I mean, I don't really want to be surveilled. Not today, Zuckerberg. But who the hell am I kidding? I run a podcast. They already have all the information they want. God damn it. Anyway, we also have a website. DirtyHistoryPod.com, which has episode archives, show footnotes, transcripts, musings from yours truly, like the one you just heard, and a whole lot of whatnots, completely free, of course. We have artwork for the show provided by Woodrow Cower. You can check out all his magnificent work on Instagram at Woodrow Draws Pictures. Woodrow Draws Pictures. He has a shop on Etsy. He does commissions. He wants your money. Give him all of your money. Give it to him. We have technical support and video direction by Lucas Farrell. And once again, I'm Tommy Thompson. This has been Dirty History, and I hope you join me next week 
I repeat, I hope you join me next week.